Welcome to the CAS Health Podcast, the show where we hope to connect our community with healthcare information that's relatable, understandable, and useful to your life, and where you get to know better the neighbors providing your care here. I'm your host, Ann McCurdy, and I'm joined today by Kat Neiman. And in today's episode, we're talking about occupational therapy with our guests, Ashley Williams and Amber Michael. Before we get started, two quick disclaimers. First, the comments in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the views of CAS Health. Second, the information in this podcast is not intended to be construed as personal medical advice. Always consult your primary care provider with your questions and concerns regarding your health. So let's get started. Welcome, gals. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Yeah, you're welcome. So the first segment here, we like just to get to know you a little bit. Um, We always say getting to know the neighbors behind the care. I am Ashley Williams, and I am an occupational therapist here at Cass Health. And I'm Amber Michael, and I'm also an occupational therapist here at Cass Health. We've got rapid-fire questions, and you both have to answer. You don't get to take turns. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Where are you from? Um, I live in Bridgewater. I grew up in the area, but that's where I live right now. This is Amber, and I grew up in Manning, and I live in Oakland right now. So So we've got, like, the western part of the state covered. Yeah, pretty much. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent. And what are our favorite sports teams? Uh, This is Ashley. I honestly do not have a favorite sports team. Um, My family, my husband and my kids pretty much go for the Huskers or the Broncos, but I don't really care either way. (laughs) (laughs) And we are an Iowa State family, so... We cheer for the Cyclones. All right. If you're cooking dinner to impress, what are you making? Um, I pretty much my go-to is always um, hot ham and cheese sliders and apple crack dip. That's pretty much the two things that I always. The ones with like the butter over the top yes. and everything. Oh. Yep. yep. Okay. Yeah, yep. Yeah. That's probably usually my go-to. It's super easy and all the kids like it and you can make a lot of them and you can make them beforehand and that's pretty much, yeah, my go-to. And then apple crack dip is probably the other one. It's. What is in it? Um, it is cream cheese, sugar, brown sugar, and vanilla. And you mix all that up, and then you spread it out, and then you put um, chocolate chips, toffee chips, and then caramel sauce over the top of that. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm in. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Mm-hmm. We mm-hmm. usually eat it with apples, or um, Erin, our PTA, does not like apples, so she usually eats it with graham crackers, But so you can kind of go either way with it. But yeah, I've had people eat it with either. It sounds like the kin- kind of thing my kids would eat with a spoon. Oh, yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes, for sure. It goes pretty fast. Okay, Amber, what are you making? Well, if I'm really wanting to impress someone, I wouldn't be cooking. It would be my <laughs> husband <laughs> cooking. He's, he's much better. Um, but he does say I make a pretty good Mongolian beef. So mm. that's that Ooh. would probably be the, if I'm trying to impress. Mongolian beef, good yeah. recipe. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we're going to give you each $50 to spend locally. Where are you going and what are you getting? Ugh. Um, this is the only one that I wasn't for sure for some reason. Um, I would say, uh, here in town, um, probably the girls, I don't know, just something with the family. So like the bowling alley would probably be like an easy one that you could go and do something all together. And so yeah, I'm pretty new to this area. Um, so I'm not quite sure what Atlantic has all to offer, but I know my house in Oakland has a dirt yard. So I'm looking to go to any nursery (laughs) Mm -hmm. or greenhouse, garden center. We need to spruce that up. So yeah. And that's all coming soon. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Favorite holidays. Mine for sure is Thanksgiving. Um, just because my grandma is literally the best cook. And so her food, it's just, we all look forward to it every year, and the kids probably, it's the same thing. They just, every single thing, and it's just, there's always something to look forward to. So Thanksgiving's probably my favorite. It's not as, I feel like, as busy, and the food is just the best part. I would say St. Patrick's Day. I don't know if it's just today's <laughs> well, vibes. Yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah. I love the traditions and uh, just all the little decorations, and it's a smaller holiday, so, um, you know, it's often overlooked, but... Also, the corned beef and cabbage. I love that. And Heck soda yes. bread. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> That's great. Um, what will we never catch you doing? 
two things probably. I will never go on a cruise because I hate water that I cannot touch <laughs> in and probably skydiving because I also do not like heights. So those are probably two things I would not ever do. You know, normally I would say something like this with a microphone in front of me. We're like, tortured here. Yeah. <laughs> so this karaoke, you will never see me like that. No. <laughs> something with a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, thank you for being outside of your comfort zone today. We appreciate it. Uh, what's better, the book or the movie? I think it kind of depends, honestly. But, I mean, I don't know. I'm more of the – the book always has more details and more information, and it just always, I think, portrays it a little bit differently. So I always say kind of the book. I say the book, too. I tend to fall asleep during movies, so the book. <laughs> okay, you're driving alone in the car. Visualize. <laughs> What are you jamming out to? What are you singing your heart out to? Honestly, for me, it's literally everything. I pretty much run the gamut as far as music is concerned. So I'm anywhere from like Meatloaf, Ario Speedwagon to Garth Brooks and Luke Combs. Like I'm pretty much everywhere. I'm not big like rap wise um, or like super hard rock, but pretty much anything I will listen to. But you enjoyed that Super Bowl halftime show. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 50 Cent? Yeah. He was here, I was like, yes. And he's yes. upside down. Yeah. <laughs> this is magic. Um, I would say oh, I have three little boys, and when I'm in the car alone, I just like pure silence. <laughs> like, that, is, that is it. Um, but I also, I'm one who likes everything, but lately I've been loving the Hamilton silent track. That's, <gasps> yes, girl. That yes. Has, that's what I've been jamming out to, that or silence, so it's one or the other. <laughs> Actually, are you ever in the car alone? <laughs> right. I, well, the half hour the drive I from, yes, from you Oakland can enjoy here. your yes. <laughs> and from work, silence. that's about yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> um, high school or childhood nicknames? I honestly did not have one. I mean, I can't think of anything that yeah I didn't either there was another Amber in my class growing up so you know is you know I'd refer to by my last name sometimes but other than that no no probably same for me there was two Ashley's so yeah it was more if middle names like Ashley and then middle name but Mm -hmm. not really nicknames I next or dream travel destination um Ireland is probably like biggest on my list of places that I want to go um it's just oh just beautiful and the culture is very interesting and that would probably be my top are you gonna skydive or take a cruise there no yeah no neither airplane airplane I can do airplane I can do but no no (laughs) (laughs) again I don't know if it's the St. Patrick's Day vibes but I also said it Ireland (laughs) okay well I see something in your future maybe a little joint trip you know Yeah. yeah We always like to get to know with our providers why you chose your career. Like, what is it about um, occupational therapy that drew you in? So, Ashley, let's start with you. Why occupational therapy? When I was um, in high school, I originally wanted to do early education. That was kind of always where I wanted to do, what I wanted, you know, just the route that I wanted to take. Um, I wanted to go to Northwest Missouri State forever, and they have an amazing program. So that was just what I always had in my head. And then for some reason, when I um, started, like, my general education, it just didn't really seem like that's what I wanted to do anymore. And so I took one of the interest surveys, and occupational therapy was one of the things that popped up, and I had no idea what it was. I had never heard of it before. And so I started looking into it, and I actually had a cousin whose boyfriend's sister was an occupational therapist. So I actually was talking to her about it. They do a lot with pediatrics when I was looking everything up. And so that seemed like a pretty good, I guess, compromise between the two of them. And there was just a very wide variety of places that you can work and things that you can do and people that you can help. So that's kind of why I went into it because it still had the pediatric aspect to it, but it also had so many other areas that you could work in and just so many other things that you could do. And it just seemed like it was never ending possibilities for that profession how about you amber why why occupational therapy um honestly i when i was in high school i had no idea i was all over the board i wanted to do everything uh, and my mom she is a nurse and her doctor's office uh would you know get referrals and are you know get the plan of cares and kind of see the progress notes things like that and she's like amber i 
really think this is something that you would enjoy doing. And so I would job shadow the OT that was at the Manning Hospital and kind of like here where she, she does a little bit of everything and that kind of opened my eyes up and was like, wow, this is pretty diverse and um, then go to school for it. And uh, like every class was like, oh, no, this is my favorite. No, this class is my favorite. And, you know, so it's pretty diverse and that's something that I that I really liked about it. You can specialize, you can stay broad um, depending on what job you have. You can kind of tailor to your own interest. Okay. So tell us about the education and training you've both had and then maybe a little bit about your work experience so far. So Amber, why don't you go first this time? Yeah, yeah. So I went to College of St. Mary uh, and I went there for my undergrad and my graduate. From there, I moved to Minnesota um, and in Minnesota, I had several jobs that were all over the board, which was a great thing as a new grad. I was part-time in PRN um, for four jobs at one time, which was like home health, uh, a skilled nursing facility, the Mayo Clinic up there, and um, another skilled nursing facility. So between the four companies, I filled up my week to be full-time. And that was awesome. It kind of gave me a little bit of direction on what I liked and didn't like. And uh, then when we moved back down to Iowa, uh, the positions that were available were in skilled nursing, which was, which was great because I love geriatrics. I love grandma and grandpas. That was, that was fun. And I stayed in that uh, Ankeny area doing geriatric care at skilled nursing facilities in that area. And then um, my family and I, we moved over to this side of the state. And uh, now I'm thrilled to be here because it's a little bit of everything, this mm-hmm. rural a hospital setting is it's everything what about you Ashley so I started my uh, college career at SWIC and did general education there um, and then after that I went to North Missouri State still because that's what I um, had always wanted to do while I was there um, I found out that they did not really have an occupational therapy program of any kind um, so luckily I was able to transfer to College of St. Mary after a year of being at Northwest Missouri State. I finished out my undergrad at College of St. Mary and then my graduate year also there and got my master's from College of St. Mary. Um, after that, or while I was there and doing my um, clinical rotations, I actually was offered an interview here at the hospital and luckily I was able to take a job here and I have been here ever since. Um, It's a great place to work, and I have been able to grow as an occupational therapist and really, you know, expand my specialties, and um, it's just there's such a wide variety that you can do here, and it's it's just a great place to work. So as far as education goes, I've heard you both have a master's degree. An occupational therapist, a master's degree is required? Yes. Yes. Um, They actually have changed now to a doctorate degree, Um, so the program is changing College of St. Mary is now a doctorate program um, and all of if you start out now um, and I think it even started a couple years ago I believe yeah, I'm not that sure when we're g- grandfathered in for yes. having yep. master's degrees um, we don't have to go back and get our doctorates so um, whatever you're grandfathered in as is what what you have to have um, but yeah I think I think two years ago I believe that they started out um, that they changed it to be a doctorate degree so now, if you go, you will have to have your doctorate degree. One thing I really like about our OT department is that you guys always have students. Always. You know, and <laughs> I, I, you do. I, I think that's so good for our patients, for the students, and for you guys, too. You know, you're, you're passing along your knowledge and passing along that wisdom um, and growing the next generation of OTs. Yeah. I yeah. think this place is a great place for students, too. Because I agree. Because they get that a little bit of everything. The power wheelchair eval and... Um, there's upstairs with the acute floor, um, the med surge floor, and then outpatients. You know, there's just a lot of different areas that you don't really see. Well, I think even here, too, you know, we are such a close-knit department as far as, like, the rehab department's concerned that for students in general, I think it's such such a huge, you know, advantage for them because – I mean, each of our physical therapists each have their own specialty as well as the OTs have their own specialty and the speech therapist. So they get to see those things and they get a chance to observe those things. And I think a lot of places, just from my experience, even with clinicals, I mean, a lot of the places I went, you didn't necessarily have that and you didn't get to see the other disciplines and you didn't get to have that experience. And so I think here we're such a tight knit and such a well, you know, diverse 
rehab department that I think it's such a good learning experience. And in even not just the therapy department, I mean, you know, our surgeons are such great help and are always willing to, you know, let students observe and other departments are the same way. I mean, it just, it's, it's a very, very good learning experience and so many opportunities for students. We want to know more about occupational therapy and the diversity of what you do every day here at Cass Health. So we'll start with what is occupational therapy? It's not what it sounds. Um, usually the answer or the, you know, what people say to us is um, I don't have a job or I don't need help with a job. And it is not an occupation as far as a job is concerned. So um, OT is pretty much just a therapy that is really specific to promoting health and well-being through just people's independence with their occupations which that is meaning actually like your activities, we call them activities of daily living. So it's just anything that you do throughout your day to take care of yourself, take care of others, um, any hobbies that you have, any just extracurriculars that you do. It does include your job technically, um, but that is just one of your activities of daily living. So we really, OT is more about getting people as independent as they can after an injury or an illness Um, or, you know, anything related to stroke, um, TBI, just any type of injury, disease, illness. um, We are working with you really on getting your independence back after those events and after um, anything that you, that has happened where you're not able to take care of yourself or just even, you know, take care of others. If you are somebody's primary caregiver and something happens to you, you know, if you're not able to do that anymore, that is one of your daily skills. So we work with people just to be able to get back to their independence, essentially. So do you guys ever get confused with physical therapists? Absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, you know, physical therapy, they have that great name where it kind of gives away what they, what they do. And uh, uh, like Ashley said, the um, occupational therapist, people confuse with the occupational um, but, you know, we, we kind of complement each other. You know, you need to be able to get up and move around in order to do what you need to do during the day. Uh, so you need that strength. You need that mobility. Uh, but we're kind of focusing more on how you are doing your dressing and your bathing, um, how you are getting to work and doing your job or the things that you need to do around the house. And I think really, you know, again, like our department is such a tight knit department that, I mean, we work with PT on a daily basis, whether it's inpatient or outpatient, just in whatever we're doing. Um, you know, they may be working on like Amber said, like their mobility and just their walking, but, um, you know, we can kind of collaborate those two things together and work on different things along with PT that they may not necessarily, um, see as a priority, and we can convince them or, you know, educate them on the importance of, of collaborating the two of us together. And, yes, you go for a walk with physical therapy, but you being able to do that will also help your ability to get yourself dressed or get in and out of the bathtub or, um, you know, make yourself meals, different things. So what's a day in the life of an OT at Cass Health look like? <laughs> <laughs> Everything. Um, we see inpatients and outpatients. So that means inpatients are people that are actually in the hospital for an illness, um, injury, um, hip and knee replacements, hip and knee replacements. Yep. Um, pretty much anything that puts somebody in the hospital to stay. Um, we work with those people upstairs and then, um, we also work with outpatients as well. Our day is completely different from day to day. Um, one day we may not have any outpatients and see all inpatients. The next day we may be going back and forth from inpatient to outpatient um, all day, just back and forth nonstop. Um, as far as the inpatients are concerned, um, we usually work with them on being able to get themselves dressed, do their bath independently, get on and off different surfaces, whether it be toilet, chair, bed, um, and just being able to, again, get back to what they were doing prior to being in the hospital. Um, A lot of times they're very weak or um, they just aren't able to, you know, with the hips especially, you know, you're not able to bend over and put your pants and your socks on, those kinds of things. So we work with people on um, tools that they can use to to do those tasks without having to bend over. And uh, we 
work with the nursing staff on the floor and the CNAs, hospitalists, everybody up there. We really communicate with them on how patients are doing, how close they are to being able to go home, whether they need to go home versus maybe possibly need to, you know, go to a different type of setting, whether it be a assisted living or um, a skilled nursing facility for maybe some more care. Maybe they aren't able to safely go home. So we work a, a lot with them on that as well as care coordination too. And just, you know, collaborating with them and helping the patients have essentially the most, you know, the safest discharge plan that they can. Um, so that way they aren't right back into the hospital with the same issues that they had or, or possibly worse. And then, like I said, we're back and forth. So outpatient wise, um, we see pretty much anything from um, infants all the way up to, you know, 100 years old and work with them um, on if they, so uh, occupational therapy is mainly the upper body when it comes to outpatient. So wrist fractures, elbow fractures, um, pain in the arms, um, anything that's related to the arms essentially when it comes to outpatient. So we're mainly working on that with them, um, getting their, their movement back, their strength back, and their coordination back. Um, again, just trying to get them back to where they were before their injury or their illness or whatever it is that you know has impacted their ability to, to have the same function that they had prior. So for hands and um, anything upper body, um, so we have new providers that I'm sure that you'll be working with or having more mm-hmm. referrals with. Um, so Dr. Bodendorfer, because he's our shoulder guy. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> and then Dr. Shu, who's coming on as a hand specialist yes. as well. Yes. So yes. I assume that you'll be collaborating with them pretty regularly. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yep. Dr. Shu, we already do. Yep. Um, she has, since I've been here, she's always referred people that are from around here that have seen her in the clinic. She's always referred people. So I have a feeling that we'll get quite a few referrals from her because, yeah, we've already worked with her in the mm-hmm. past. So it sounds like you are working with a wide variety of patients. So you are caring for patients of all ages, correct? Yeah, yeah. So we are across the entire lifespan. So from um, infants to uh, the geriatrics, the the grandmas and grandpas, the people up to 100 years or older. Um, So we're working all over and with any problem or disability or delay. Um, You know, for kids, it may be more of a developmental delay or they're having troubles in schools. Um, for adults, it may be more of an illness or an injury um, that we get referred for. Um, and then the the older, the geriatrics, you know, it may be for for cognitive evaluations or just being able to essentially maintain ma- their independence. Yeah, more maintain than their independence. Age in home, you know, introduce that adaptive equipment if it's needed. We're kind of all over the like, the lifespan and kind of covering lots of different problems or illnesses or disabilities as well. And just even providing education. I mean, I feel like, you know, every every age has a different type of education that they need and just a different, different area that you can offer them, a different service you can offer them. So, um, you know, I think education is just always something, you know, no matter the lifespan, even if it's just not necessarily that they need strengthening or they need, you know, help with, you know, their independence. It may just be an education, like whether it's a home modification or adaptations or, like I said, tools or just anything that we can provide them that can make things easier for them and make things, you know, less of a burden and just to mean that make them as independent as they can. OTs are like the best problem solvers. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, you know, really? That's a prerequisite, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So let's talk about kids. I know my kiddo is a patient, and my eyes have been opened. So let's talk about that. What What do you work with kids on? Pretty much anything. Anything that they're struggling with, whether it be fine motor. So, I mean, that means um, anything that they're doing with their fingers, anything that's very, you know, that, that fine movement, those, you know, um, buttoning buttons and handwriting and all those little things where they're using those fine muscles in their hands. That's more that fine motor. Gross motor, whether it be upper extremity or lower extremity. So, you know, being able to catch a ball or kick a ball or even getting dressed. I mean, gross motor even goes into that as well. You know, being able to coordinate their arms through their sleeves and their feet through their, you know, their pants and um, just those little things as far as just overall motor is concerned. But those are the things that most people think about when they think about, you know, issues with their kids. But um, the things that people don't think about is, you know, like the visual thing. So visual motor and visual motor is such a huge thing when it comes to the gross motor and fine motor too, because people don't think about 
how much that that visual motor really affects their ability to do those gross motor tasks. What is visual motor? So your ability to observe, recognize, and just use that visual input to about, you know, different things in your environment, whether it be shapes, forms, just different objects in your environment. If you don't see something the same way that somebody else does, you can't complete that task the same way. Your How your brain perceives that visual information, it can be completely different than somebody else. And a lot of it comes into a safety, you know, safety concern and like the gross motor, being able to climb a jungle gym or being able to walk or, you know, like kick a ball. I mean, if you don't see that ball the same way that somebody else does and you go to up to kick it, you're going to be completely not where you need to be. And then fine motor is a huge thing as well. Being able to write your name or copy a shape or be able to cut. Um, if you, if your body isn't able to see that that's a shape or isn't able to, to see the difference between like two shapes on a page, then you're not going to be able to cut out that shape the same as somebody else if your brain isn't able to process that information the same way. So that's a huge thing that people don't really, aren't aware of or don't really think of because it's not something that, that they, you know, know to think of or know to look at it's more just the the fine motor and the gross motor part but there can always be some type of visual thing that can really affect your ability to do those things and even you know self-help too with kids um being able to get themselves dressed being able to get themselves undressed those are all things they should be able to do by kindergarten for sure usually like three to five is probably the range where they should be able to start you know or should be able to get themselves dressed and be able to do things independently for themselves. So we work on those things. Shoe tying is a big thing. Um, Buttons is a big thing. Zippers, any fasteners pretty much. And then sensory processing is another thing that nobody really has any idea. Um, If you're not in the profession or you're not in the medical field, even honestly, sometimes, you know, medical professionals that don't deal with it every day don't really have any idea what it is or how it can affect kids or adults too. I mean, it's something that Everybody has something mm-hmm. that's sensory. It yeah, just... I can't touch raw meat. I, that's yeah. a sensory thing that I just cannot do. No. Yeah. Uh, and kids, they, they're experiencing, they're, you know, they're learning about the world. So there, there's a lot of things that may be adverse to them that, you know, like the textile, uh, the texture of your shirt or um, other, other things that, you know, they'll have to experience in life that they'll, they'll have to adjust to or uh, figure out how to um receive that input for their body and how to respond to it too Mm -hmm. i mean like that sensor processing is just it's your ability for your body to process essentially your five senses so i mean you know your touch your taste your smell your Mm -hmm. your hearing your it's just your ability for your body to perceive those things and if you're not able to perceive those the same as somebody else or even just effectively you know there's there's people that or it's called hyper, so it means you're like you're oversensitive. So like Amber said, you know, like the textures and things like that. If you're oversensitive to touch or taste or smell or, or even auditory is a, hearing is a lot. Mm-hmm. You know, we have a lot of kids that are very startled by loud noises. Just even something that's not necessarily loud, but that you know to them is loud. Um, and I think that's a hard thing for, for people to really understand when it comes to kids is that, you know, it it may not be that they're just acting out because it may be, you know, that they're not able to, to respond or cope. Yep. Like they're just overstimulated or Mm understimulated. So it's not just that they're a boy and they're roughhousing. It may be that they're not getting the input that they need from, you know, just walking down the hall, like you or I Mm -hmm. get, they need more input and they need just more than what they're getting so it may seem something different than what it really is and that's such a huge huge area that is just not really addressed or there's not as much I feel like information provided on those things even you know in school it's a huge thing too and there are OTs in in all the schools um, but if that OT is not asked to be you know part of that child's intervention or um, if they're not you know made aware of that then obviously they're not gonna be able to help so it's just there's a lot of areas kids is such a huge huge thing how do I know that my child might benefit from working from you too like is there any red flags I should watch for I would say 
a red flag to look for is like is your child meeting developmental milestones that's probably the biggest I would yeah say. and it, that's something you can talk about with with your primary provider uh is you know it, they ask all those questions at the well child um checkups and seeing if if they are at the same uh, so those age. are things like are they jumping are yeah. they like um brushing their own teeth are they riding a tricycle mm-hmm. like all all those sorts of things yes and your biggest thing i mean of course they're always going to look at mobility first i mean that's just you know your gross motor comes first that's just kind of how it works mm-hmm. the biggest thing i always say is if you have other children don't compare them to your other kids just because you know you're firstborn was walking at nine months and your you know second child is not walking at 13 months is not necessarily that they are delayed it's just that they you know may not be advancing as quickly so it's just again talking to your primary care provider and seeing if they have any concerns and even if it's something little I mean just making sure that they're aware of that Um, clumsiness that's a big thing Again, just because they are a boy does not just mean that they are clumsy and that that's just how it's going to be. There can be other issues. Um, There can be just a strengthening thing or sensory thing, um, different options. Handwriting is a big thing. If their handwriting is not legible, um, if they aren't able to use scissors by the age of usually four, um, if they're not able to use scissors correctly or at least attempting to use them, that's another big thing too. Being able to catch a ball, that is probably another thing um, that they should be able to. Yeah. Just any size ball? Just you start, yeah. with the, start with the big one? Start with the big mm-hmm. one and then go from there. Um, our standard, like our testing that we do on kids for coordination, we're actually using a tennis ball. I oh, mean, that's, that's okay. what we use for our standardized testing. So essentially by, you know, age five, six, I mean, we're having them catch a tennis ball and so I mean yeah a big ball if they are not able to bring their arms together to be able to catch that ball if they're not looking at it that visual motor so they're seeing the ball and then they're connecting it to what they're doing yes so if their arms are coming together way before the ball gets there or if their arms are coming together way after the ball hits their chest and is already on the ground sure then those are big things to look for sensory things would be you know if they're avoiding certain textures um touching as far as like hugs or you know different things that are normal you know that you would think would be normal Um, if they are avoiding excessive amounts of different types of foods or specific types of foods so like if they are really avoiding like soft foods like uh, applesauce and mashed potatoes and yogurts and those things or really crunchy foods like crackers chips um, apples is a big one Um, if they're avoiding any Thing that seems to be consistent so not necessarily like they don't like apples but I mean if you see a consistent thing where they avoid all crunchy foods or all spicy foods or all soft foods or or they prefer like super spicy foods or they prefer crunchy foods or those are the only things that they eat those are big big red flags when it comes to sensory thing auditory would be more yeah like startled by loud noises or what you would not consider to be a loud noise like if it's something that's you know shutting of a door or something that you would not think would really startle you or the opposite of not even registering those loud noises or those things that you know that you hear because again those can be really big like safety issues and then um being like overactive i know that's a big thing for for a lot of kids, but excessively overactive. So not just your typical, you know, into the school day, trying to get all your energy out kind of thing, but just really excessively crashing into everything or having to really, really roughhousing to the point where, like, you just don't know how they are doing that all the time and they're not getting hurt or they're not stopping. Like, they're doing it for excessive amount of time. Or opposite as well with that, too, not avoiding anything where they are – off of the ground at all or they will not climb on anything they will not get off of the ground that's a big one as well with that so kind of looking for those two extremes yes okay not down the middle more just the extremes I mean there can be little things here and there but you're looking for the consistencies the consistencies Mm -hmm. for those kind of odd things that you you don't feel should really be typical (laughs) 
So we always like to give out some useful tips or tricks or good to know information. Um, what words of wisdom would the OTs have for us? Yeah, I think movement is the best medicine. So, you know, move your bodies. Our, our bodies are meant to move. I would say don't let a problem go too far. So it's always easier to address something sooner than later, um, whether it be, you know, pain or um, lack of strength or just even your ability to do things. Address it sooner. You're going to be able to, I'd say, get better quicker or easier or it's not going to take as long. You know, nothing is ever a quick fix by any means, but, you know, the sooner you address it, the the less time you're going to have to really heal from that or um, change things. And then um, there's always a tool for everything, especially in the mm. OT realm. Uh, like the sock tool oh, in the yes, reacher. Yeah. So many yeah. things. So many things. And there's always. A button hook. Yeah. You know? There's nice. so many tools for every single thing. And um, we are definitely, I mean, I think we're kind of nerdy when it comes <laughs> to like our OT tools. Um, we really like to, you know, show people what's available. And arthritis is a big thing, I think, when it comes to tools. You know, people just think I have arthritis, I have to live with it. Yeah. And, you know, tools are just, there's so many things out there that, you know, can help with that. And I just think tools are mm-hmm. our big thing for in our, in our world, I yeah. guess. Yeah, if we can't help you get the um, motion back, we, we want to help figure out how to, how to, how to compensate yeah. or how to adapt it uh, so that you can do the things that you want to do and what you love to do. And Just because it may not seem like a simple fix to you, I feel like we're good problem solvers and, you know, kind of figuring out different methods for things, different ways to do things that maybe maybe you haven't thought of or would be not something that you would have ever thought that you could try or thought that you would do or thought that you would that would even help. So I think we're good with those kinds of things as well. And then Google isn't always the answer for everything. So just because it's on Google does not necessarily mean it's the best exercise program or the best option so always you know ask somebody that that knows what they're doing and and is a good resource always find your resources seek out the experts yes Yes. let us help you ashley amber thank you so much for joining us on the podcast um it was a delight to have you here and to learn about what ot's do and um you are some of our favorite problem solvers and we're glad you're just across the hall from us yeah thank you thank you for having us yeah